It's midnight. The moon is shrouded in darkness, and every street light mysteriously isn't working. It's Halloween, and you're listening to Lo-Fi Poli Sci. Oh yeah, Lo-Fi Poli Sci podcast coming at you. I'm your host, Michael Pickering, and I hope you're ready for a spooky horror-filled top ten list today, because we have our good friend Gregory Day, a writer, director, bookseller, and the voice behind Hipsville AD, the blog that is the one-man fanatical sect of God's subculture with fervent ramblings of all breeds of cinematic pleasures. Gregory Day back with us to give you all the goodies for your pre-Halloween movie marathon. Gregory Day, my friend, how have you been? I'm pretty damn good, man. I'm very excited to be here for the spooky season. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Me too. Halloween's one of my favorite times of year. It gets me ready for Mardi Gras. All right, but let's jump into this list, my friend. What top 10 list do you have for us today to get ready? For yeah, Halloween? man, it's time. Here to scare your ass off today with an introduction to international horror. Ooh, international horror. And we all know I'm not, no, I'm a scaredy cat, man. I'm not a big horror person. <laughs> me. So we'll see how this goes. Let's, let's yeah. dive right into it. Coming in at number 10 is. All right. Yeah. So uh, I just want to preface this list before we get into it, uh, that these are necessarily ranked. Uh, they're just, um, and, you know, I have to put them in a 10 list. So I wanted to make sure, um, to kind of come out first and say they're not really ranked because they're by country. I don't want to repeat country, so I don't want to make it seem like one country is better than another. So uh, we're going to start in Asia and move west. So I just want to preface that uh, up front. But we're starting with number 10 is from Japan. Uh, it's a film called Haosu from 1977. Uh, and this is one of the most bananas movies you're ever going to see. And I say that it's one of the most bananas films you've ever seen because it is a wild um, haunted house movie. And a man actually does turn into a bunch of bananas in the film. So uh, I did want to <laughs> throw that little joke in there. But uh, it's a wonderfully, like, colorful pop art um, horror film. It's it's almost at times like a television commercials. But it is a, um, it, it's got a lot of, like, gushing blood and, and dismemberments and stuff. But it's like a, uh, like if a Scooby-Doo episode, episode was on acid, it's about a bunch of schoolgirls <laughs> that go out to see one of their... Uh, grandmother so to find out that she is either a witch or a ghost and she's haunting this house and it's just a really psychedelic trip once they get there uh someone gets eaten by a piano it's just uh one of the most vividly entertaining thrilling funny and and really sincere horror films and um uh, you know for any for all you gore gorehounds out there it's just uh you know it's, it's a really great time and this this movie looked simply insane i mean the trailer <laughs> the trailer went from crazy scary to fun loving like hippie woodstock feeling you know and then mm -hmm. a piano eats somebody and then another person <laughs> they pull a head out of a barrel and i mean dude it's just nuts it's nuts yes. this is interesting for sure yeah yeah so, all right uh, coming in at number nine what do you have for us yes yeah, uh, completely switching gears here we're going to south korea uh for a film from 2016 called the whaling uh and this is definitely the youngest picture on this list but it is the most epic it's a three hour masterpiece of storytelling and sh uh, constantly shifting gears. Uh, so it's sort of um, a detective story at first about these uh, deaths happening in this little village in South Korea. And then it kind of shifts into a zombie film and it kind of shifts into a, a sickness film and it shifts into sort of a possession film. Uh, then you get to the heart of it and it's like this demonic um, thing happening in this village. And, it, and it's, uh, it's a really great mix of stuff because it starts off with uh, this bumbling cop who is sort of an idiot, but it's like a small town, so you can kind of get away with being this idiot cop that really, um, you know, it's too much for him to handle to be investigating this thing, but it gets so personal for him and his family, and he's trying to save the village, and it gets really dark and really scary uh, by the end of it. Yeah, this one I'll say looked intense as hell, and, and you're right, it's the youngest film. You could definitely tell it's the most recent one from 2016. And whenever I was watching the trailer, it definitely gave off this vibe of kind of like a crime thriller horror. But then, like you said, it switched gears to to so many different other things. And at, at moments, I couldn't tell what it was. And like, I definitely didn't get the whole zombie feel from it. So I was just like, I didn't know what to make of this one. But it was definitely an intense trailer. And I can mm -hmm. just imagine a three hour long horror thriller film. I don't know about that, buddy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I will say that uh, it is aptly titled. <laughs> all right all right let's jump into number eight then what you got for us yeah we're really jumping uh from asia to europe now um i, just, I wanted to add here that there, you know not every cinema culture has a lot of horror films so i did want to point that out as we skipped over 
um, you know, India and Asia, or, you know, parts of Asia and Middle East before we get to Europe here. Um, there are some out there, but they're very hard to find. And, um, but uh, in the Halloween spirit, so we kind of jump over to some of those things and we're gonna start in Poland. We have this film from 1961 called Mother Joan of the Angels, which is one of the most frightening like Christian films I think I've ever seen. Uh, but Poland has a rich history of cinema and they have a very specific like thing about how distressing and horrific their films can be, but they're not always horror films. So they're, they're really unsettling films. And if you're familiar with like Roman Polanski, like how his films kind of border on thrillers and, and uh, drama and horror, that stuff kind of really um, is, is a great example of Polish uh, films and, and, and their relationship with that, with that sort of genre stuff. Uh, but this film was set in the 17th century and it's about a, uh, a group of nuns who are collectively possessed by the devil, or they claim to be. And this young priest goes out there after the previous priest went to try to exercise the convent and died. So he's there um, to try to, to try to exercise the entire place. Once he gets there, it's a total madhouse and it is scary as hell. Um, the performances are amazing. The cinematography is, is really creepy. And um, it just gets down to like this ancient evil that's in Europe and um, sort of bringing in different religions, whether they're Jewish or, or Christian and trying to battle this thing. And um, it's just really, really great and a really frightening movie. Yes, indeed. So I'll say one thing, and then I do have a question for you as well. So all I'll say on this one, a black and white film, possessed looking nuns in a monastery, <laughs> and the entire monastery is the setting, like, hell no, dude, this looked so creepy to me. It really did. But like, but let me ask you, so this was 1961. Mm -hmm. This was in the heart of Soviet Poland, right? Poland's a communist yeah. state. And this movie was made. How gory mm -hmm. is this film or how horror is it? Because I'm curious, like, how much they would be willing, how much could they get away with, you know? Yeah, it's more psychological. Um, it doesn't really have a lot okay. of horror or violence, really. But it's so visceral that I think it's, you know, it's psychologically violent, uh, especially when you have a group of women who are, for lack of a better term, um, you know, acting hysterical in this monastery or excuse me, in this convent. Um, and this guy just not having the, the fortitude to be able to overcome what's going on. Um, I think that is sometimes scarier than you know, gore on screen. And the performances really come through. Definitely, definitely. I was interested about that. Whenever I saw the date and I was watching the trailer, I was like, how much are they not showing? Mm -hmm. Well, next up, coming in at number seven, where are we going? We're going to Germany this time. And we're talking about Nosferatu the Vampire. Um, and this is the 1979 Werner Herzog adaptation of it, um, which is a tribute to the original silent film. Uh, Germany's got a great history of horror films, but mostly from the silent era. Uh, but Herzog did a tribute to it in the 70s. Um, you really wanted to um, shoot them in the same locations from the, the 20s and um, really capture like the feeling of East Germany and like tra traveling Transylvania and catching the countryside and how inherently uh, spooky it is. But, he, you know, he, it's an adaptation, even the original is an adaptation of the Dracula novel. Um, but so it follows that basic plot, but Herzog takes it even further and he really focuses on death that follows the vampire when it arrives in Germany, as opposed to when it arrives in England in the novel. Uh, it's all very German, um, but it's like, when the vampire arrives it's this harbinger of death and it, it brings the plague with them and it really causes a great upheaval in in germany um but it's just really earthy and dark and brooding picture uh but herzog has a very specific sense of humor so there are like really weird uh humor absurd humoristic things in the film where you know people are interacting with dead people and it's just kind of off-putting and weird and strange and you just also kind of making a comment on you know the nature of these stories and how absurd they are but uh he's really getting down to you know how the bloody and, and dark history of europe and um it's it's just a great vampire film and it's just a really like dark and gothic tale yeah this this trailer really gave me the distinct impression of bram stoker's dracula film you know the one with keanu reeves but it also very much made me automatically especially when i, I saw 
Nosferatu in the film, I was like, dude, 1922 film, Nosferatu. I was like, and it made me wonder. So is this like a remake, a reimagining, or like, how would you compare this? Because I also like, I really did get the idea of Bram Stoker's Dracula movie, but did that movie take from Nosferatu? Or is that just the book is like that and they all borrowed from the book? I would say they all borrowed from the book, um, specifically the original film, the, the 1922 Nosferatu, the Bram Stoker estate actually did sue them for uh, copyright infringement. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that happened. But I think to a certain extent, Nosferatu to me has always been the, the character uh, that's kind of in those films, the Nosferatu vampire, the bald vampire with the with the more rat-like features and more uh, monster, you know, uh, monster qualities of it as opposed to Dracula. Uh, it's always been even scarier because um, it's less of a seduction uh, than it is a monster, you know, coming for you. And um, in this one, yeah, there's no like, there's no like, like you said in Bram Stoker's Dracula, how he has he has a few different forms, and one of the forms is where he is passing as human and he's very sexy and stuff. But right, Nosferatu right. doesn't have that. <laughs> like Nosferatu doesn't have different forms. He's it is just uh, a monster. Yeah, I mean, this one caught me. I was just like, it reminded me of so many different things and I didn't even know it existed. So I think it'd be cool, especially for people who aren't necessarily into black and white films or silent films. But if you want to revisit something that's based on or like similar to one of the first horror films ever, or I mean, can you think of any other earlier horror films than Nosferatu 1922? Yeah, I've never seen it, but I do know there is a Frankenstein adaptation from um, Thomas Edison that predates that one. Um, really the like thomas said, edison yes the thomas edison wow i yeah. would have never known that i'm gonna have yeah, to look for of, that yeah he did a lot of film experiments i've never seen any of them i'm not really uh interested in i mean i guess i should see them but i'm not really interested much in thomas edison giving some of the things he had done in the past um in his life but uh yeah i think frankenstein his fr frankenstein i believe is the first if not if not one of the first uh, horror films interesting interesting all right, well, let's keep on moving on. And what do you have for us for number six? Goodness, yeah, number six. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm very excited to talk about this one. It's called The Iron Rose from 1973 from France. Um, it's from a director named Jean Roland, who to me is one of the most overlooked horror filmmakers ever, or at least here in America. I'm not really sure uh, what his relationship is with modern France. Uh, but he's known for making these really moody vampire flicks uh, some, and some zombie flicks. Um, very small budgets, but he, he would make them on like countryside in this very foggy um, atmosphere and like gothic locations, like old ruins in, in France and stuff. Um, and you always have these really strange tales of, of vampires, mostly like women vampires in these isolated locations. But Iron Rose, which is not very different in its setting, um, it's kind of different in its um, characters. It's about this young couple who breaks into a graveyard um, in the middle of the night to spend the night and, and be alone in, in, a, in a spooky location. Um, but once the sun sets and they've had all their fun, um, they can't find their way out of the graveyard. And it's just like this labyrinth of them trying to get out of it. Um, and it sort of starts to uh, make them turn on each other where they're not in so much in love anymore. And they're just, they're just desperate to get out of here. And it's just this um, kind of back and forth of, of sex and death as they're trapped in this ancient... I wouldn't say ancient, but like this, you know, uh, really old French graveyard. And there's a lot of um, deep caverns and and um, you and I are from Louisiana. So it's, it reminds me of this sort of uh, cemeteries we had in Louisiana where they're all, of, I'm sure there's a specific word for it, but the above ground crypts and stuff. Right, uh, right, right. As opposed to like kind of a, here in Texas, it's just kind of like flatland graveyard. So to kind of paint that idea, it's like this old uh, crypty graveyard. And it's just a really um, great exploration of sex and death on screen is it the back and forth and push push and pull there um you know it's, and it's just a great moody kind of kind of hard film surely man this this may have been the weirdest creepiest and frenchiest trailer out of the whole punch i mean this is all kinds of weird all over the place i mean the the two lovers going crazy in the cemetery at night i mean that's just one thing we're not even going to touch it okay it's too easy too easy all right but then getting freaky in a hole filled mm -hmm. with bones all around them. I mean, like, dude, there was some crazy shit up in here. It was, it was so French. I was just like, 
damn. I was like, all right, all right, I got you. You know, I really got the the vibe that this was was kind of like at the tail end of the French New Wave cinema after like the 1960s and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You get to definitely get a vibe of uh, the women's liberation uh, movement uh, in that time. I mean, it's not about that, but you definitely get the, that it's from that time period. Right, right, right. All right. Let's see what you got up for us at number five. Yeah, we're heading to Spain for a film from 95 called Day of the Beast. Uh, which is uh, maybe the second craziest film on this list uh, after Haosu. Um, this is uh, action horror comedy about this priest who figures out when the Antichrist is going to be born. Uh, it's on Christmas Eve, I believe. And um, so he tries to sin as much as he can to uh, get to meet the devil and try to stop it. But uh, it doesn't quite really work that way. So he seems to teams up with this uh, hokey TV psychic and a heavy metal record store clerk. <laughs> and they kind of go on this journey across Madrid, trying to, I think it's Madrid, but this, the city trying to find and pinpoint the location where the Antichrist is going to be born. And they get into all kinds of crazy uh, scenarios. And there's a lot of like action, uh, action packed set pieces that are really funny. And just, um, it's just kind of like a screwball comedy at times, but it's also got this underlying message about uh, anti-nationalism that, um, you know, is it worse uh, than any, anything we can imagine the devil, you know, uh, has, has done, but, um, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's quite a surprising film. I have, it's actually the film I've seen probably the least on this list. I just recently saw it, um, maybe in the last year and it really blew me away that I hadn't, hadn't heard about it until recently, but, uh, man, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Now this one here may have been my favorite trailer of all of them. I mean, the premise <laughs> first off, it's pretty cryptic, you know, you get it, you know, someone finds out when the antichrist is going to be born, but then you really get it that this priest thinks he has to sin in order to get things done to beat the Antichrist. And it just swings full gear into like comedy. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what is going on here? Like, I got to say, I'm pretty interested in this one. And from 1995, I mean, it's a lot of interesting stuff coming out at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very fun. All right, now let's move on to number four. What do you have for us? Yeah, uh, we're going to Italy uh, for a film that's a very... Uh, personal favorite of mine called Suspiria from 1977. Um, I could have done an entire list of Italian horror, honestly, but um, I, you know, wanted to keep it eclectic. Uh, so this one uh, really embodies Italian horror for me. Um, it's bright and colorful and it's gory as all hell. Um, but it's, it's this tale of an American ballet student. It's even the movie is set in Germany, uh, but it is from Italy. Uh, who's in this German ballet academy who is starting to suspect that there are some weird things going on at the school and some of their fellow students are getting murdered and there's all this sort of uh, inklings about witchcraft going on at the school and things just really get out of, out of control. Um, it is sort of an adaptation of Snow White and Seven Dwarves, even though there's no dwarves in the movie, uh, but it's sort of like this idea of like these children and this witch um, this you know European fairy tale, but in this ballet school, uh, it's really really known for its like grand scale and scope inside the school and the color scheme. It's lots of reds and lots of blues, uh, so it's it's really it's a really scary ride, but it's uh, a feast for the eyes. And I was I was really surprised by this trailer because, I mean, I thought at first it was just a, a movie about the world of ballet in Italy. You know, it was just things were happening and I was like, okay, okay, nothing seemed too weird or horror like. And then halfway through the trailer, people start dying and there's this dog gnawing at someone's neck and a monster comes out of nowhere and it's like death and blood and it gets really, really gory. I mean, in a trailer, it gets gory. I could only imagine <laughs> mm -hmm. in the film what it would be like. And then boom, it, it like stops and it's this white word on a black background and it's Suspiria, the title. And it's like, damn, I'm like, all right. All right, I see you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will say that the movie is not exactly that um, totally like that sort of like one tone where it's like a lot of horror films, like you slowly are lured into the terror. Um, it starts off immediately with oh, really? that shit crazy suspense scene, high, very gory, and then it sort of calms down and then it amps up again. And it kind of calms down. So it's a roller coaster. Um, and it, it's, it's very dear to me. It's a great, great movie interesting interesting all right coming in at number three yeah we're going to the uk this time we're talking about peeping tom from 1960 this is one of the most controversial films to ever come out of great britain um 
It came out the same year as Psycho. And it does some very similar themes, except for it's a little more perverse than Psycho. Um, at least it supports like on-screen portrayal of things. It's about this cameraman who likes to photograph women as he murders them. And um, I should say he films them, not necessarily photographs them, but he films them uh, when he murders them. And uh, it's in full, like technicolor. And it's just this uh, exploration of this twisted individual. It's got these great set pieces. And um, it was so ahead of its time. It's not particularly gory or anything, but I think just the subject matter was so ahead of its time that it just ruined uh, the director, Michael Powell's career. Uh, after that, he, had, he didn't really make, I think he maybe made one more movie after that. And, um, and he was one of the most predominant filmmakers in in the country at the time. Like he had he had made a ton of movies over like 30 years before that. And this one was just too much for people. And um, but it's a spectacular film. I mean, it's 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 more like a big production, like a Hollywood production with its color and its its uh, sets and stuff, as opposed to uh, Psycho, which looks more like a TV production. So it's got a lot more going on uh, on screen and visually than it's kind of, you know, it's, it's like it's counterpart to Psycho. So. Uh, but this film is just, uh, it packs a lot of punch. And like, if you watch it today, even though, you know, it's over 50 years old, it's, uh, it's, it still gets under your skin. Yeah, this, this flick came off as extremely meta to me, you know, a, a horror movie about a killer who makes what it looked like horror movies, you know, or a cameraman, mm -hmm. at least as the premise. And I imagine in the 1960s, especially 1960. So you're, you're just barely out of the 1950s there, buddy. And then this comes along and it's like, man, I bet it did ruin that guy's career. I mean, that's tragic, but I mean, yeah. Wow. Like cinema 1960 doing this. I was just like, that's, that's a mm -hmm. lot to chew off. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would say like if you compare it to Psycho, like they came out the same year, um, and Psycho has the shower scene, right? So it's a very famous shower scene, and um, it's nowhere near as as an indictment to the audience than Psycho is, because it's like you're watching someone murdered from the point of view of the camera, and it's like the camera is killing you, like the audience is participating in it, and that is just well ahead of what anyone was thinking about horror films and how it relates to cinema and how violence relates to audiences and all that stuff, kind of mixed in there um yeah just probably too much for people back then yeah yeah i imagine <laughs> so <laughs> all right let's go ahead and get into our number two yeah we're uh jumping the atlantic here we're coming over to north america for our number two pick to canada we're talking about the brood from 1979 uh directed by the famous uh filmmaker david cronenberg if you don't know who david cronenberg is he's the master of the body horror film uh, he's done films such as Videodrome and Scanners and The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. Um, but The Brood is one of his earlier movies, um, and it's about a, a, a couple that's going through a divorce. And he made this movie as he was going through a divorce. And uh, it's about a single father who was trying to take care of his, his daughter while his wife is, is recuperating in, a, in an experimental uh, psychiatric ward. And um, people start being murdered around him. And uh, it's there are these really weird childlike things that are appearing and, and committing these horrible, brutal murders of these people around him. And he's trying to solve like, what's going on. And it's all kind of leading towards what's happening with his wife at this experimental facility. Um, and once it gets to the end, uh, it is a true shocker of body horror and um, just emotional violence. Um, that you know this movie came out in 79 even until today when you watch this film the end is going to leave you speechless and you know after i watched this trailer i was still unsure of what this was really about you know which I, i'm sure is part of the mystery and thriller effect of the movie itself but i know one thing if you put a little girl in a film and she is screaming in terror then like nope nope not gonna watch it no way <laughs> Yes. But, you know, I do have a question for you. You, you dropped this line a couple of times, a body horror. What does that mean? I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Sure. Yeah. So body horror is, uh, there's a few different avenues of it, but essentially it's just exploring the changes of the human body uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, so Cronenberg, a lot of his films really focus on that. So um the Fly, if you've ever seen The Fly, it's probably his most famous film, is about a man turning into a fly. So it's That's very crazy. Methodical. Oh, I can't say. <laughs> very methodically <laughs> oh. <laughs> Right. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it shows how his body is decaying, right? In Becoming the Fly. And in a film he made called Videodrome, it's definitely about how media is changing our bodies. Uh, he made another great film called Crash, which is about these people who are sexually aroused by car crashes. But it's also but there's also a character in that film who is very interested in how automobile accidents are changing the physiology of the human body. Um, to another great example is a film called Tetsuya, the Iron Man, which is from Japan. Um, and that film is about uh, a guy who starts turning into iron and sort of this is metal fetish and how machines are changing our bodies and stuff. So yeah, body horror is definitely a, a bunch of different avenues, but yeah, it's all about how our relationship to our bodies, our disgust of our bodies, or how our bodies are changing over time with science and technology. Interesting, interesting. I like it. I dig it. I dig it a lot. Yeah, and uh, just one more thing about the brood. It's 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 not quite the body horror like that, where it's in in about the changing of it. It's this one is more about, I guess, the emotional um, stress and 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 torture and, and emotional violence and of, of like how this divorce is putting on them how that is affecting the body interesting interesting yeah that i mean definitely those things do do make sense because the psyche affects the physical body as well for sure mm -hmm. all right and now to your number one for an introduction to international horror what you got yeah so uh this is top five movies for me here so everyone uh, will probably stay clear of me for the, forever <laughs> after I talk about this film <laughs> but um I wanted to do number one I didn't want to pick a specific country I wanted to talk about an in that international collaboration so a uh, number one movie is a film called Possession from 1981 it is from a Polish filmmaker named Andrzej Zulowski uh it's in English but it's set in Germany and it stars a French actress named Isabella Anjane who's also in the Nasrati film we talked about and uh the famous uh New Zealand actor Sam Neill so we've seen Jurassic Park, he's the lead in that movie. Um, this is much earlier than that. And so it's a huge collaboration, a bunch of different um, countries kind of involved here, but um, it's very similar to The Brood and it is also about a divorce. So if you want to have the, the most depressing and worst double feature of your life, watch The Brood and <laughs> Possession together. Um, but uh, this one is, is a really tough movie. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's very tough. So don't go into it if you're not ready to really sit through one of the most uh, emotionally and um, you know visually antagonizing movies you're ever going to watch um, but it is it's set during the cold war and it was made during the cold war it was really shot in an apartment just next to the wall so you could actually see the troops guarding the wall uh, in the film in the background uh, outside the windows but it's it's set there specifically because it's about a, a couple that's going through a divorce and it, you know it's in a city that's divided it's about this this couple that's divided and um and then it starts to get into psyches that are divided. And so uh, it's about this agent who comes back from an assignment, uh, which is also ambiguous is kind of what he does. But when he gets home, he finds out that his wife has been um, unfaithful to him. And yet when he's trying to figure out what's going on with her, like who is she with, she is tailspinning, uh, psychologically tailspinning, and he can't figure out what's going on with her. And then his obsession with her is uh, also starting to fracture his psyche and start to he goes on down his own emotional and psychological uh, tailspin. Um, but it all kind of leads to trying to figure out what is going on with her. And it gets even darker and deeper and scarier than uh, I think anyone getting into the movies, everyone to expect. Uh, it gets into some real deep cosmic horror um, and kind of like trying to figure out like who was, who was my wife sleeping with and, and going in just, you know, head first into some, some strange shit that you were not prepared for um, <laughs> on the other end of, the other end of that. Um, yeah, it's called possession as a, in, in, a, not in a ghost movie kind of way, uh, like the exorcist or something, but more in like possessing someone, um, as you know, or keeping someone as your possession. And what that does to other, to you know to your partner and and so forth. So, um, and Andrzej Zulowski, if you've read my blog, uh, did a top ten list of his films on my blog, um, and I've talked about him a few times. He's one of my favorite filmmakers. He's got um, a style all to his own, and um, it's often compared to Hysteria, um, for lack of a better term. And um, they they move at like 100 miles an hour, so it's a hard film to keep up with because um, the emotions are so high for so long. Um, but it is a fantastic film. And if you're lucky enough, the 4K restoration is making its theatrical 
uh, run right now uh, across the country. I'm going to be able to see it in the cinema for the first time next week. So if you have the opportunity and you get the stomach for it, I would highly recommend that you go and see it. I'll go ahead and tell you, my friend, romantic thriller horrors creep me out to no end. I mean, the idea of what couples do to each other is a horror film in itself, but yes. the actual horror film about it, I mean, man, that's freaky. And this one looked like no exception. I mean, from your description versus the trailer that I watched, like, it seems like the trailer doesn't even graze the top of it. Mm -mm. Um, for how intense this this whole experience is and i could not imagine watching it in theaters and you say it's running right now it is running right now yeah it just got a 4k restoration um and i don't even know i can't specifically say if it ever actually got an american release in the theaters it may have um but this may very well be the first time it's going to play across the country interesting stuff interesting stuff and there you have the list my friends but now as is our custom on any top 10 list. Let's dig a little deeper. And Gregory Day, why did you choose this list? And in particular, an introduction to international horror. I mean, why no American horror films like your Candyman or Halloween because you know, they both got films coming out or your Freddy's, your Jason's, Nightmare on Elm Street, Hellraiser, Puppet Master, Leprechaun. And of course, one of my personal favorites, Leprechaun in the Hood where he wraps <laughs> the whole thing or Jason goes to space because why not have Jason go to space? Or like the more serious side, what about like the famous ones, like The Shining, you know? Like what mm -hmm. made you decide to stay away from American horror altogether for your list? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to throw a little shout out to uh, Leprechaun in the Hood and say that a friend with weed is a friend indeed. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> um, yeah, I chose, you know, I was going to do one, american film for this list but then i was like you know what let's just keep it international let's just keep it away from america because it's so many there's such a huge wealth of american horror films and i think that if you are already someone who watches horror films you're pretty familiar with those they're so ingrained in our culture and a lot of them have, have really crossed um into the you know into the mainstream and if you're on tiktok or anything right now you can see plenty of people are dressed up as michael myers and running around and, um making jokes about it and stuff so it's just like real mainstream stuff and it's like or it wouldn't say mainstream but you really ubiquitous um so i want to put together a list that would kind of reflect some of the darker or more obscure titles um out there in the world and kind of um as i do when i come on here to make a list kind of want to have a broad spectrum of of the subject we're talking about and um kind of ho hopefully turn some listeners on to some uh some hidden gems out there yeah, for sure. You had 10 different movies in 10 different countries. So I say you did a good job of doing just that. But did you have uh, did you have any runners up or anything yeah. like that this time around? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's several from each, like multiple, multiple countries where I was like, oh, I got to narrow down to one. I can't do three Japanese horror films. I can't do five Italian horror films, you know, but uh, specifically the one that I wanted to talk about was called uh, it's from Hong Kong in the early 80s. I think it's maybe from 83. I could be wrong. Uh, called The Boxer's Omen. And um, it is a like psychedelic kung fu splatter flick. It is really fucking crazy. It is <laughs> to be to be a kung fu horror movie. Yes. I might be able to get into that. Yes, I, I would recommend it if you could track it down. Um, and what's the like, name again? The Boxer's Omen. Boxer's Omen. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. And just out of curiosity too. Did all of these horror films come out around Halloween? Do you know? I don't actually know. I don't think so. I don't know if any of them ever really came out around Halloween. Because I know now, like, it's it's almost every year, it seems like Halloween is the time for horror mo movies to come out. But I just wonder, you mm -hmm. know, like, Halloween wasn't always as big as it is today. You know, if you go back into the 70s and 60s and 50s, Halloween wasn't celebrated at the same time. So... I imagine, yeah, horror films probably just came out whenever. They didn't always come out around Halloween like they do now. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they just kind of came out because they were always like a niche audience thing. And they kind of had their own producers and their own directors who were kind of always making those movies and making marketing campaigns and stuff. And especially when the, like the teenage audience became a bankable demographic, you know, it was like that the need for that kind of went all year long. And um Countries like Italy, which was like, I didn't know this until very recently, but they had very little TV options. So they're, the reason there are so many Italian films out there, like 
uh, especially with the exploitation films, like they had to keep cranking them out because there was nothing for people to do at home. So they'd go have dinner and go to the movie. And they needed to keep having, you know, more and more movies made so that they were constantly fresh in the theater. So I could see countries like that where um, horror films were cranked out all year long. Interesting, interesting. I never knew that about Italian cinema. That's pretty cool. And a final question for you, and one that we always ask, why is this list important? And I mean, you know, you know me, I'm not a horror person, but I get it. <laughs> lots of people are, and lots of people are doing their Halloween movie marathon right now, and it's all horror flicks. So I get it. I get it. But, you know, tell the people out there then, mm-hmm. why is this list important to you? Yeah, yeah. So I apologize for my dog here. Oh, uh, no, her. we love, we love animals. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's having a good time out there. Um, this list is important to me, yeah, because I, I really, I really would, you know, want people to be able to branch outside of this, the stuff we were just talking about with them, your Michael Myers and your Hellraisers and stuff, and they have eight movies in a series or whatever, and these, these uh, repetitive franchises, um, but I mean, some of those franchises do have good entries in them, so I'm not knocking them entirely, but um, they're all these sort of, you know, different, weird and, and um you know, special kinds of horror that are in other, from other countries, and they you know they open doors to other kinds of things. And um, and as a, as always, as a film fan, I'm always looking for different things from different cultures across the world. And their cinema always is going to um, you know open that door. And then what scares people in other countries is definitely not what scares us in America. So it's always interesting to see those things as well. But it's also like from a filmmaking point of view, seeing how the Italians, you know do horror on screen like Suspiria looks about as far away from you know any American horror film um or Haosu the Japanese film um just their sensibilities is what um really grabs my attention and uh, when we do these lists I hope that I'll be able to uh pass that along to other people and they'll be able to see these idiosyncratic and weird and, and fun and uh thrilling things from across the world yeah for sure and I will say that you know, I could tell from all these different countries and watching all these different trailers for the film said, you must certainly see some things in there that you would not think of in an American horror film or in American cinema at all, really. Um, and, and in many cases, you would consider it taboo in American culture to necessarily put some of those ideas up front. And I could imagine like a couple of those films, if they were done in the U.S., would probably end some director's careers, you know, just like <laughs> it, it did in, in, for a few of them and the one in the U.K., Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you are right. Like, it probably to a degree, different things scare different people around the world. But I would always also say that I imagine at some base level that all humankind, like, there are some things that scare all of us, no matter where you are, like pulling a head out of a barrel and having it yell at you. That's pretty scary anywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not the biggest fan of them, uh, so I didn't really, re- including them in the list, but ghost films, I think, are are very interesting to, to your point about how they scare us collectively um and, and when i watch international ghost films i'm always interested to see the cultural context um of what's happening in, in a korean ghost film or an indonesian ghost film or um you know a Euro- versus a european ghost film where it's like very christian centered or something like that but i think the base level of being haunted by ghosts tracks across all countries yeah, there's something about the dead coming back for you that just that doesn't sit well. That's excellent stuff, my friend. Let me say thank you so much for coming back on today. We always like to have you with us. But before I let you go, why don't you tell us what's the latest thing you've been working on for the people to look for with Hipsville AD? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on the show. And uh, yeah, uh, for the month of October, I've been doing some double feature essays where I, I talk about two movies that go well together and I talk about the... Um, compare and contrast them so it's called the complimentary creep series and i have a few of them up already and i'm gonna have another one coming up uh, the week before october i mean before october ends excuse me and um and that one will be sort of a marathon um so it's gonna be a long piece but it's a sort of a marathon uh pick a movie so uh head over to substack at uh, baddate.substack.com to check out that blog excellent excellent and where else can the people find you out there on the webs yeah, uh, I'm on Letterbox. I'm Hipsville AD on Letterbox. You want to follow me there. And I'm on Instagram under the same handle. 
And thank you again, Gregory Day, for coming on. And everyone, that is this Tuesday's top 10 list. And do you have your own top 10 list ideas? Send them on in. Do you have questions for our friend Gregory Day over at Hips with AD? Connect with him. Always remember that low fi poly size is more than just me. It's the we that we be. Peace and well-being to all my human beings. Much love and always the best. Pickering and Day, signing off. <laughs>